Welcome everyone to the fifth Singapore Literature Festival in New York City, organized by Singapore based literary nonprofit. The biennial Singapore Literature Festival to the author's reading and with happy the Evergreen Review, PN Review, Forest Studies Colloquium, and Asian Pacific American Institute to bring you this festival. We also thank gratefully Lavender and Kayla Rubano from Pro Bono ASL for providing ASL interpretation for this event. The festival theme this year is Archipelago Dreaming. As the world becomes ever more interconnected and interdependent, the ideas of the Martinican writer and philosopher Edouard Glissant become even more relevant. Calling for a change in our thinking, Glissant wrote, and I quote, we need archipelagic thinking, which is one that opens, one that confirms diversity, one that is not made to obtain unity, but rather a new kind of religion, one that trembles physically, geologically, mentally, spiritually. It's the point, utopian point, at which all the cultures of the world, all the imaginations of the world can meet and understand each other with us first or lost, end quote. Today's event, Translation as Archipelago, will try to answer Sans call for such a change in thinking by bringing translators to conversation. I will introduce our moderator, Ota L. Price, two panelists, Christine Ong Muslim and Shelley Fairweather. Ota L. Price runs a publishing consultancy specialized in literature and tech design and culture. Recipient of the Gate Kunst Prize, Ota's translations from German and Italian have appeared on BBC Radio 4, Traffica Europe, Wars Without Us. Alter's translation of Julie Zay's novel, New Year, was a finalist for the Pan American Translation Prize, as well as the Helen and Kurt Wolf Prize. And Alter's translations of New Year novel, Identity, was published by House this July. Please put your hands together to welcome Alter. And I, I hope my internet connection is remaining stable. Um, it is such an honor to be here. Uh, and again, G, thank you for the introduction, for creating this entire festival. And thanks to everyone in the audience for joining us. And a special thanks to Pro Bono ASL, Lavender, and Kayla. I have had my own writing translated before and interpretation is a whole other skill. And it's wonderful that you're bringing this uh, symposium of sorts to a broader audience. Thank you so much. As a huge fan of Gaudy Boy's entire publishing program, it's an honor for me to be in conversation with two remarkable editor translators, or perhaps I should say two translator editors who have brought brilliant collections of contemporary stories from the Philippines and Kazakhstan to readers in the Anglophone world. And I just want you both to see these gorgeous volumes. The design uh, covers designed by Flora Chan, really beautiful typographic treatments, giving you a taste of what is inside. I'd also like to acknowledge that October is Filipino American History Month, so this is perfectly timed. And just the notion that Singapore Unbound, having the very specific city and country of Singapore in its title, 
has opened its doors to so many other places, and it's just a gift to be here. Storytelling, both oral and written, conveys meaning in very specific ways. One approach to defining translation might be to say it is an act committed to carrying the meaning expressed in one language through another language. Our conversation today will consider ways that translation might potentially replace, augment, or preserve one language with or through another. Can translation be practiced using what Edouard Glissant calls archipelagic thinking, effectively opening and confirming diversity, even as it obtains a degree of linguistic unity simply by bringing these texts into the hegemonic world language of English? I am certain translation can bring about a new kind of relation, as Glissant mentions, but even that brings up additional questions as to what kind of new relations. So I very much look forward to hearing Christine Ong Muslim and Shelley Fairweather Vega read from and tell us more about Ulirat and Amanat, respectively. I now invite each of you in the audience to close your eyes for a moment and picture what you you know about the Philippines and Kazakhstan. Maybe your mind is conjuring up two very different places on the globe, two radically opposed geopolitical shapes, an archipelago of over 7,000 islands surrounded by sea, contrasted with the world's largest landlocked country. Maybe you're envisioning a cacophony of customs and languages, smelling strong scents and spices, seeing beaches, mountains, a vast step. Maybe you're remembering a past home or the place you were born. Maybe you're already dreaming. Maybe you're archipelago dreaming. Maybe your mind is blank. Whatever the case may be, I invite you to set aside any expectations and step into the welcoming void of this Zoom room with me to experience these voices being given new life in English. Perhaps we'll tremble and maybe we'll even stumble upon Glissant's utopian point where cultures and imaginations meet and understand each other without being dispersed or lost. Remember, you can write your questions for the panel in the chat at any time. With that, let's proceed to our guests and their readings. Christine Ong Muslim is the author of nine books of fiction and poetry, including the short story collections, The Drone Outside, Butterfly Dream, and Age of Blight, as well as the poetry collections Black Arcadia, Meditations of a Beast, and Lifeboat. She co-edited the British fantasy award-winning anthology People of Color Destroy Science Fiction, and I just want to observe that that title has a nice uh, parentheses around the U and the word color, which is a nice touch in translation. And she is also editor of and translator of Ulirat, Best Contemporary Stories in Translation from the Philippines. Muslim is the translator of Filipino authors, Mesanda Virtuzio Argueles, Marlon Acla, and Rogelio Braga. Her stories recently appeared in Conjunctions and Neo Decadence Evangelion, an anthology from Zagava Books, and a word to the audience, don't trust any of my pronunciations. I tend to either it it italicize <laughs> or Germanify <laughs> when I'm reading things. So I will let Christine uh, take the mic from here. Welcome, Christine. Hello. Okay. Uh, like Amanat, Ulirat, which is uh, Tagalog for consciousness, is uh, multilingual. The anthology has story translations from seven languages out of the 150 languages in the Philippines. Uh, in the case of the uh, Akiano language story in China, um, this is the first time an Akiano story has been translated into English 
to be published internationally. Many parts of the book represent historic first picture. Uh, in Olirat, five of us were in the editing team, all from different backgrounds and different places in the country. Uh, there's Daryl Delgado, John Benga, who can translate from at least three to four languages, uh, Arlo Mendoza and Tilde Acuna. The seven Philippine languages we were able to cover and translate into English for Ulirat were uh, Waray, Hiligaynon, Ilocano, Cebuano, uh, Kinaraya, Filipino, and Akiano. Godi Boy has been an excellent collaborator in helping us navigate the especially complex politics of literary translation in the Philippines. Uh, colonial education in my country, uh, it sort of ensured that the primacy of two languages, Filipino and English, uh, comes at the expense of all the other languages in the country. So uh, let me read a section from our introduction to Ulirat. The modern short story form may have been formally introduced in the Filipino classroom by American colonialists in the uh, early 20th century. But the genre developed early on from religious texts such as sermons, novenas, and brief accounts of the lives of saints. A century before the Americans came, the short form found life not only in Spanish, but also in Bicol, Ilocano. These are languages in the Philippines, ethno-linguistic groups, uh, Hiligaynon, Cebuano, Tagalog, and other Philippine languages during the rise of the printing industry. The Tagalog had maikling kwento, the Ilocano calls the short story, Sarita, the Kapampangan, Salita, and the Hiligaynon uh, refers to it as Sugilanon. Uh, the Cebuano, Mubong Sugilanon, and Waray, Susumaton. Uh, anecdotes and tales, such as the Tagalog Dagli and the Visayan Binirisbis, Binirisbiris, were also precursors of the literary genre known today as the Maikling Cuento or the short story. These forms may be traced back to oral narratives that include ballads, folk tales and epic cycles that have long been widely practiced in the islands. Uh, now I'll read an excerpt from Ulirat, which is uh, from my translation of the story Snake by Perry C. Mangilaya. Snake is the story of a couple where the wife was uh, claiming she gave birth to a snake because an encanto a nature spirit had uh, impregnated her through a curse. Though I really think she, she cheated on her husband and just used the curse to cover up her infidelity when asked by her often irritatingly naive husband. Uh, my translation approach to the story was to uh, mainly let some of the untranslatable words be and then I, I just added a few words here and there to clue in the reader, the reader to what those terms might be. Uh, translating them into English might, might rob the story of its folksy charm. So here it is. Uh, Your wife gave birth to a snake rebel, according to his mother-in-law. This was how the news first reached Rodel. His immediate reaction was regarded as a joke. Ridiculous, he thought. 
What had gotten into his mother-in-law to have come up with such a bizarre joke when she was not the type to be pulling pranks? The grave tone she used while talking to him over the phone, however, told a different story. The news forced him to make an unexpected trip to his hometown in the Visayas, to that place that had seen modern and to that one barangay that was not too far behind in terms of access to technological advancement. He decided not to tell the engineer, even his foreman, both of whom were his peers at the construction site, uh, about the real reason for his sudden trip home. He simply told them there was an emergency and that he had to go home as soon as possible. What baffled Riddell, however, was that if his wife had indeed given birth, then that meant she had been pregnant. And how could she have ended up pregnant when he was in Manila working for the past 10 months as a construction worker? They were nearing the end of their construction project, which meant he could go home in the intervening period before the start of their new project. He was supposed to make the most out of his off work period spent with his wife. After all, he had been clocking up on overtime and save up a portion of his earnings aside from the amount sent monthly to his wife. And here he was forced to go home out of schedule. His mother-in-law told him that once he arrived home, she would tell him the whole story, as well as the reason for his wife's giving birth to a snake. He might even have doubts, but she assured him that the albulario, the town herbalist and witch doctor could prove a snake had emerged from his wife's womb. His mother-in-law offered proof, a snapshot of the snake. It was purported to be a black snake, the size of a child's arm, and was still born. That's it. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so, so much, Christine. I also just want to observe um, that you're reading this. I don't even know what time it is where you are, but um, I know it's not the same time of day as here. <laughs> so it's really, really great to hear you. And, um, you know, I have many more questions for you about the editing process and the translation process. So, um, but I'm, I'm taking notes and I, I'm going to remind the audience at any point, you can drop your questions in the chat. Thank you again, Christine. And now I would like to introduce Shelly Fairweather Vega. Shelly Fairweather Vega is a professional translator of Russian and Uzbek based in Seattle, Washington. She translates poetry, fiction, screenplays, and more with a special focus on the contemporary literature of Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Fairweather Vega holds degrees in international relations and Russian, East European, and Central Asian studies. As a translator, she is most interested in the intersection of culture and politics in modern history. Once again, a friendly reminder, drop your questions in the chat. And with that, I will pass the mic Thank you very much, Alta, for that lovely introduction. I'm very happy to be here today. I also want to thank uh, G and everyone at Singapore Unbound and Gaudi Boy um, for this invitation, most of all for bringing out Amanat, our collection of uh, Kazakhstani stories in English. Um, Amanat is a multilingual collection from a multilingual place, again, just like Ulirat from the Philippines. Um, our goal was to sort of document and celebrate this 
multiculturalism, multilingualism in Kazakhstan um, with our collection. Um, we ended up with 24 stories uh, by 12 different women um, split between stories originally in Kazakh and stories originally in the Russian language. Um, and then we worked as a team. Um, I translated Russian language stories and my partner Zara Batayeva translated the Kazakh language stories um, into English. Um, and we kind of checked each other's work and put it together into one big whole. Um, so that's Aminat. Um, I want to tell you about um, Kazakhstan as well. Kazakhstan um, is a place that's multilingual because of a process of colonialism, like so many other places in the world. Um, Russian is spoken there because of Russian colonialism. And this is a vital thing to understand, um, especially these days when all over the news suddenly we hear Putin talking about the Russian world, protecting the Russian world, and we hear him, uh, well, we see his methods of, of uh, defending this idea. But as the Russian language spread out from the center of the empire, um, both the Russian empire and then the Soviet Union, um, it created this, um, uh, this like kind of trickling of the language into other places, maybe in an archipelago even. Landscape of those countries, including all over Central Asia. So one of our priorities again with Amanat has been to point out through translation that Kazakhstan has its own stories to tell. Um, not just Russian stories, right? And these stories are related to its history of colonial dominance by the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. But these stories also need to be read and considered um, in their own right as more than Soviet or post-Soviet uh, products. We also have to make sure that the Kazakhstani stories that we tell in translation go beyond stereotypical Kazakhstani topics. Um, and again, I point out that the stereotypes we have of Kazakhstan, um, if you thought of anything when Alta asked you to close your eyes before at the start of the session, what came to mind might have been stereotypes brought to us in English by Russians. Um, I've had a Kazakhstani author um, tell me before that he really wishes Kazakhstan, Kazakhstani authors were allowed to write about more than sheep, kumis, men, and funny hats. And because these are the stereotypes that have been, um, you know, uh, shared with Kazakhs and said, this is what you guys know about and what you should write about. Um, so when we choose text for translation, we try to um, honor his wish to kind of move beyond the, the sheep and the funny hats and tell the stories that Kazakhs want to tell themselves. Um, there's been a, a divide traditionally in Kazakhstan between um, Russian language and Kazakh language writers and their work. Um, since Amanat was published, um, I've been very happy to see that some positive developments have taken place in this regard. So now in Kazakhstan, there's a bilingual workshop for writers inviting uh, authors who work with both languages. Um, there are literary journals that embrace work in both, both languages and publish the originals and translations that the authors do for each other. There's literary prizes with both languages and so on and so on. So I think maybe Kazakhstani writers now are coming to think of um, these individual islands of, of language and culture in their country uh, as connected um not separate anymore maybe they form one whole entity even in their diversity i want to read from um, one of the last stories we included in amanat this is the lighter by the writer olga mark um, this is one that was originally written in russian um, it has no sheep or kumis or men in funny hats in it um, it could really in fact i think take place anywhere in the world um, the lighter is a somewhat shocking story of a little girl named verka um, who is a child prostitute in an unnamed big city. But Verga has such joy for life that we can almost forget our disgust and our pity for her and at, at what she does. And I think it's this um, emotional confusion or emotional ambiguity that gives the story its power. The translation challenges um, for this story were, um, first of all, making sure that Verga comes across as um, simple, lovable, and invincible all at once. Um, also conveying uh, the real magic in her world and her worldview, and also keeping the setting anonymous. So some readers might recognize kind of a post-Soviet city down on its economic luck with abandoned buildings and big disparities in wealth in the story, but I think it really could take place almost anywhere. Um, so I wanted to make sure the translation reflected that as well. Um, this section is at the very end of the story, and it takes place with our, our hero, Verka, speaking to um, her gang of um, homeless kids 
who are camped out for the night in the basement of an abandoned building um, that's been half built and then, and then left alone. I bought this too, said Verka, and she took a lighter from her pocket. So somebody asked her, giving her purchase an uninterested look. It's just a lighter. It's everlasting. It lasts forever. Verka held the little red rectangle with rounded corners proudly above her head. Nothing lasts forever, laughed the dark-skinned boy who looked like a gypsy. This one does, this one does, Verka chanted, and she traced a finger lovingly over its smooth surface. They told me it does. You're so lucky, whispered the girl who always sat quietly in the corner, the youngest of them all. You always have money and you know so many big fancy words. That's the way I am, Verka crowed. She spun across the room, one hand flicking the lighter, the other holding an open vodka bottle, and she was happy. The warm room felt good. The little flame flickered and went out. The kids around her were getting ready for bed, but she wanted to go somewhere, do something. It didn't matter where or what, as long as this drunken happiness could go on. Let's go upstairs, she called to them. Let's look at the city. It's night. It'll be great. You're wasted, the shaggy-haired guy. I told her, getting under a blanket with one of the girls. It's cold out there, we'll freeze. But Verka was already going up the rickety flight of stairs. She opened the door at the top and then up, up, up to the last finished floor. The sharp, cold air seized her. She gasped in delight and she pulled her coat closer around her. Verka walked to the very edge. The city winked at her with dozens of bright windows, the holiday lights in the streets, the colored flashes of the ads. It was cold. At night, nature forgot this was a Southern city. Verka took a hurried gulp of vodka. She flicked her lighter mechanically as if adding one more small flame to the sparkling night. And she looked off into the distance. For her, the view from up above was always spellbinding. She looked for a long time over the city, sprawling in all directions, and then, frozen, she started to dance. Soon, laughing and yelping, spinning in circles, she had her head tossed back and her arms thrown out wide. When she stopped and went back to looking at the city, it seemed to her that the lights in the window were being carried away, whirling unrestrained into the measureless blackness of space. Everything was swimming, the headlights, the houses, the streets, the wayward planet was flying into the unknown, drawing after it the slim lobe of the moon and the sun, wherever it was hiding, and the fragile winter stars. Barely holding back, full speed ahead, Verica shouted at the light smeared into thin, bright streaks. Kind people have compassion for a poor orphan. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. And if I remember correctly, that line, kind people have compassion for a poor orphan, also starts the story, correct? Yes, it comes in the beginning. It's part of yeah. her, her act. Yeah, okay. so it's a, nice, it's a nice sort of bracketing there. Thank you both so much. Um, Christine and Shelley, these readings are so engaging. And your insights, you know, I very pointedly did not go out of my way to introduce you know how many collaborators you worked with on these on these books um because i knew that you could do it better than i could so i'll just once again show everyone these these covers um so i'd like to start my questions for both of you by asking about your titles and i mean that in two senses first your professional titles and they what what they mean to you uh do you consider yourself editor translators translator editors or something else entirely and please feel free to add any thoughts on your working philosophy as well um shelly would you like to start sure Alta, thanks for giving me the easy question to start with um i consider myself a translator and even though um my name is on this book cover as an editor as well i think i'm an editor just by default because there is you know nobody else around to, to do that work. So I like to translate. That's how I kind of communicate with the world. Um, and if somebody needs me to pick out the stories worth translating, then I'll do that work as well. But I'm a professional translator first and foremost. Great. Thank you. 
I'll actually take this opportunity. Yes, Shelly, your name is right at the top of the cover. Next to your colleague, is it Zaure Batayeva? Um, and this book was blurbed by the first anthology of its kind by Hamid Ismailov. I am not certain. I need to do my homework. I know that um, his Manaski or Manashi, uh, this novel um, translated by Donald Rayfield has been released by Tilted Access, another press doing really remarkable work. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know that that's actually distributed in the United States, but I, I won't get us mired down into the, the politics and economics of publishing and how we get to access these stories, but I want to use that to sort of underline how essential the work that, and how special the work that Gaudy Boy is doing in publishing these books. Uh, Christine, are you a translator, editor, editor, translator, something else? Uh, editor translator has uh, quite a nice ring to it, so it's more pleasing to the ears. I guess I'd prefer to be called an editor translator. Uh, that one is concerned first with uh, making choices on which text, which author before embarking on the translator part of the equation. Uh, professional titles aside, my major concern is always in finding which publisher might be receptive to any project I have at hand, uh, which brings to the fore that one is not only a translator, one has to hustle and mediate, act as a mediator to get the manuscript off the ground and uh, make it into a book. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's it. make it into a book, but also make sure that people then find the book, which is, you know, Singapore Unbound as a festival does a fabulous job of this. So thank you for that. The second follow up to the first question that I have for you both involves the titles of your books, uh, your collections. Christine, you mentioned, you told us uh, all that Ulirat is Tagalog for consciousness. Uh, Shelly, I wanted to ask you, I know that you address this in your foreword, but do you want to share with us uh, what Amanat means? And then um, I'd like to ask you both how you selected these titles and how they informed your approach to selecting the stories. So maybe Shelly, if you want to give us a little intro to what Amanat means. It's, it's funny, I, I just have to interject here. <laughs> I wonder if every every title and translation a collection that Gaudi Boy published is going to have to end in AT. Just a thought. That's a question for G later. Okay, Shelly, go ahead. I sort of hope, yeah, that you stick to this pattern because it's really interesting. When I saw, when we first started talking to Gaudi Boy about um, bringing out our anthology and he sent me a, a copy of Ulirat to kind of show off what Gaudi Boy could do. And I thought, ah, this is perfect. This is a sign that uh, Amanat would be at home here. Um, Amanat is a Kazakh word, not only a Kazakh word. I found out it's a word in lots of other languages as well, um, with a few meanings. And mostly it means uh, legacy or sacred trust. So it could be anything from like a deathbed wish um, to um, a solemn obligation, something that needs to be honored, treasured, um, or carried out. And in this case, Amanat is also the title of one of the stories in the book. It's one of the Kazakh language stories by um, Aral Arukanova. The plot of that story is a, a, a dying mother makes a wish on her deathbed and the kids find her youngest son a proper wife. And the one he has uh, lined up for himself is Russian instead of Kazakh, so she's improper. Um, so it, it, um, the children, the surviving children, have to figure out what to do about this, how to honor their mother's wish. Um, in a way that uh, kind of keeps the family together. Um, so it's an interesting, um, I thought, theme for our book, but also addresses kind of the larger themes in Kazakhstani literature. I was talking about kind of a, the clash or coexistence of Kazakh culture and Russian culture in this country. Absolutely, thank you. And I also noticed, I think, 
you know, that we sort of touched on this earlier that Amanat is exclusively writing by women, whereas Ulirat uh, has, has a multitude of, of genders of writers. Um, and both of your collections have a lot of sex. I just want to observe that even from the excerpts you read today. So that's a fascinating connecting thread. Um, Christine, would you like to say more about the title of Ulirat? Uh, yes, it is Tagalog for consciousness, and it is perfect for our anthology. Uh, we worked towards something uh, kind of ambitious. Uh, we were helping to change the national consciousness in terms of how we translate and anthologize for an international audience. Uh, it did affect the selection. Uh, we focused on the stories themselves and not the halo of fame and influence of the authors behind them. Uh, Ulirat is the first and only best of anthology of fiction by Filipinos that had none of the usual big names in the Philippines. And that's something that always makes me proud of that book. So that's it. Excellent points. Um, although I will add that the, I believe it's a foreword or the introduction um, by Gina Apostol, who I know is participating in other events at this festival, uh, really had some wonderful things to say about, about your selection. Um, aside from this, this, one of my favorite quotes, language for me has always been the country's wonder. Um, she really talks about the importance that this is the first time this twin imagining of the English and then all of these other languages appearing in print. Um, so thank you so much for, for making that possible. So I think now I'm going to actually we, uh, yeah, I'll have one, a couple of more questions and then we do have some audience questions. So, um, Actually, I'm peeking at this first question that we got from the audience, and it might be a better version. I was going to ask you both, how can or can translation really practice archipelagic thinking? And I think that's, that's the one thing we promised to the audience in our description of this event. So, but we'll get there. And I actually feel like this first audience question has a nice approach to it. So I'll just read it. And this is from Jan or Jan, Marvin Go. Not really a question, but more of a curiosity. Archipelagic thought's significance is truly significant in the face of the 21st century world literature in terms of circulation and access of certain local experiences to be shared or marketed in the global slash international sphere, whatever that means. I am interested in the role of translation as a possible catalyst for decolonizing thought and all its significance in building and sustaining whatever local identity is left from the source language. But then the dominant language that is still the target language is English. I was left to think that archipelagic thinking is still in a way empowering a certain hegemony to some extent. I'm interested to learn more on the speaker's negotiations between translation, archipelagic thinking, and post-coloniality, which I believe is still alive. Uh, that's a lot there, but yes, role of translation as a possible catalyst for decolonizing thought. Do either of you want to speak to that? Since both of you mentioned the role of colonialism of very different world powers in, in the places from what Well, I'll take a, a stab at it. Um, in the case of Kazakhstan, you know, the hegemonic language has been Russian for a long time. So um, in this case, English has an a unusual opportunity or, but not that hegemonic power Right, so maybe English gets a chance to be almost neutral ground um, for these stories. Um, so we don't have to pick, uh, we're going to publish all Kazakhstani stories in Russian, or we're going to pick and choose 
all the Kazakh stories, Kazakhstani stories ought to be published in Kazakh, will go to this some third place, which happens to be English. Um, so I don't know if that helps the post-colonial project in the world or in Kazakhstan, um, but this, I think there's a certain neutrality to English um, in this case that, that our language doesn't often get to um, boast about. Excellent point, thank you. Christine, did you have any thoughts to add on that? Mm, with Ulirat, I think we really cannot re uh, fully remove the colonizing influence. Once you translate into English, it's always there. And you are sort of, I don't know the word, pandering to a hegemonic power when you do that. Since uh, you are, you want to um, push it for a readership the English speaking world. Uh, but with Ulirat, I think we did some baby steps in decolonizing by, by bringing languages that are usually uh, from groups that use them orally, not in written, and then we translated them and published them. So uh, we gave the voices, um, shared the voices to the world. And I think diversity and uh, representation, you know, like, like baby steps to the colonization. Thank you so much for that. And I have a follow up question because you mentioned the orality and I find that very interesting. And it occurred to me, this, um, this is a question for both of you, but I'll start with you, Christine. I wonder, um, were all, I, I, I don't want to assume, but I have to ask, were all of the stories that are in your collection, were they published in the Philippines? Um, and I ask this because, you know, I personally translate from Italian and German and both, almost every, every culture and every language, you know, there's the oral tradition and then there's the publishing world, right? And so seeing stories that make it into print, that is already one filter. Um, and in terms of bringing certain stories, it's, it seems to me, and in speaking to colleagues who work from other language pairs, it is, I don't want to say impossible, but it's incredibly difficult to make the case for publishing work in translation into English. If you can't point to an original and say, this was a bestseller in its country of origin as a print book that some editor at some publishing house chose. So sorry, I'm. this is a bit of a digression, but I want to ask, did either of you, you know, Shelley or uh, your colleague or um, Christine and any of your editing and translating colleagues, were, were any of your sources absolutely oral? Did, did any of your, um, I, I know you have the writers, so I presume at some point, you know, of course they wrote it down, but was anyone going out, you know, with a, a tape recorder to capture these oral stories? Um, how did that, was it was it you finding stories in collections or in magazines? Tell me uh, about. Uh, with us, we sifted through. Well, all the stories we translated for Ulirat were reference, so that's why it's a best of collection. So we can call it like uh, that. We did not commission anything. We didn't ask authors from uh, all areas in the country to uh, send us their stuff. So none of them are oral, uh, I wish. <laughs> like we can translate from dying languages. We just don't have that capability and skill. So yes, they were all uh, previously published from magazines, journals, books in a certain time period. So then we made our selections. Thank you. Shelley? Yeah, the answer is similar for Amanat. Um, Zare was really the, the, the scout 
for this project. So she was looking uh, through literary journals and, and collections and finding these great writers and their stories in both languages. Um, I appreciate your, your question though, Alta, because um, getting published in Central Asia, including in Kazakhstan, is not the same as getting published in Germany or other Western European countries. The publishing ecosystem and landscape is just really different. So um, there's no literary agents, for example, um, in the countries that I work with most often. Um, there is not a culture of reviewing books, really. Um, the funding is completely different. Most publishing is sort of self-publishing or the authors need to pay for it themselves somehow by raising money, finding sponsors, things like that. Um, and the government still has a kind of an outsized role in publishing in Central Asia. It's a legacy from the Soviet era when the government controlled and therefore funded everything. Um, so the writing world is kind of um, still evolving beyond that system. So when I go to publishers in the United States, they ask how many copies did it sell and how is it reviewed? In Kazakhstan, I don't have good answers for them. It doesn't really happen that way there. We need to find some other way to evaluate um, these stories. So. I could talk forever about that, but I won't, I won't right now. Thank you for the background. It is very helpful to um, just appreciate the, the work that you all have put into this. Um, so that actually brings me, let's see, uh, I, brief reminder to audience, drop your questions in the chat. I have a lot more, so I will just keep going. Um, I wanted to riff on this notion, you know, again, taking directly from Glissant's uh, quote, this idea of a point that trembles physically, geologically, mentally, and spiritually. Those four points strike me as key concepts to keep in mind when crossing from one language and culture to another. Both your collections have been reviewed as they make their way into the world, or I'll say into the Anglophone world. Can you tell us how they're being received either here or in the places the stories originated? And I guess that last part after, you know, I thought about it, I was like, this seems like a weird question, but I, I also wanna know how the authors are responding because, because it is so hard, A, to get published and B, to get your work uh, once it's been published, translated into another language, especially in, um, you know, I'm speaking as I'm sitting here in North America, we just don't reciprocate. Um, other places in the world will acquire the rights and, and translate and publish work that originates here. But percent statistic that is very, very famous, um, that fewer than 3% of books published in English each year originate in other languages, but I do think it's a helpful, uh, I'd like to think that we might be up to maybe three and a half or 4% or maybe four and a half percent. But that just shows that vast disparity. So I'm curious, have the authors, uh, and, and I guess the other side of that would be, have the authors experienced any repercussions, uh, positive or negative from their work appearing in English? Wh whichever of you wants to start, just jump. Uh, me? With uh, Ulirat authors, well, generally, positively received. So especially the, the Ilocano writers who were spotlight in a review done by Necessary Fiction, uh, Roy Vadil Aragon and Ariel Tabag, they were very happy with the uh, great reception. So yeah. No problems with that. Excellent, thank you. Shelley, how about your authors? I know I know that um, I've been seeing, let's see, your Amanat came out in July. So I've seen a few, a few, um, a couple of the reviews were, you know, sort of collections of addressing literature about Kazakhstan or Central Asia. But um, tell us about how it's yeah, I did come out um, fairly recently and we're still um, seeing nice reviews every once in a while. Um, in Kazakhstan, the authors are, I think, unanimously delighted. They're really happy for the attention and getting published in English feels like um, a really big accomplishment for them. Um, um, no repercussions, everyone's just sort of 
proud of everyone else um, who's involved in this project. So um, this might be partly because not many things get translated from Kazakhstan. So it's still a really big treat. <laughs> um, so it results in lots of gratitude from the authors, which is very gratifying for us translators. Um, it's been nicely reviewed and received here in the US and in the English language press as well, both by people who have some familiarity with Kazakhstan and Central Asia and by people who've never, um, you know, never been there or thought about the place before. So that's been nice for me too, to see how different people um, are reacting to these stories and, and um, thinking about the, the country and the people in a new way. Excellent, thank you. Um... I'll next ask, I feel as though both of you touched upon this, but uh, I think another way of approaching this question of um, hegemony and archipelagic thinking um, is to talk about untranslatables. Um, and Christine, you said that some of your untranslatables you just left as they were, um, but there are, it strikes me having read both, uh, and especially because these are short story collections, you have a, a vast variety of voices. Um, but just in the sections that the two of you read today at this event, we've got um, Barangay. I don't know what that means. We've got Kumis. Um, so I think those are my two examples. And I don't, I don't know, I mean, if you want to try and translate them for us, Maybe you could, but I don't want to put that pressure on you. I guess I'd like to ask if you have any other ex examples and how, how do you believe in untranslatables or is it an opening up of English to accommodate? I mean, what is the line between something that is untranslatable and something that becomes a loan word? Um, and I, I Many of you in the audience are probably familiar that Words Without Borders has an entire inter, you know, translators interviewing translators, but there's always the question about untranslatability. So Christine, go ahead and give us some more of your untranslatables and, and, and what that means to you, what the notion of untranslatability as a trans. Mm, Barangay is a town, so I'm not I purposely did not uh, put it into English because it sounds good saying it's a barangay, but the albulario there, I, I, I added a clause, which means a witch doctor or an herbalist within the story. Um, untranslatables, uh, well, there, there will always be untranslatable terms. Uh, as long as one doesn't put in footnotes, oh God, I don't, I don't want to read translated stories with footnotes, uh, explaining the terms, explaining just uh, the best approach to that, because translation is always, you're always attempting to put things into English. And uh, maybe I'll add in some context clues along the way uh, to cue in the reader as to what that strange foreign sounding word there that I retain in Filipino. So that's that's usually my approach. Uh, untranslatability is a beautiful thing. I think we must we must welcome it. Uh, the thing that makes the world go round. We embrace other people, we embrace other cultures. We leave that on. Shelly. I agree with Christine 100% about uh, footnotes <laughs> um, and kind of sneaking in explanations in the text where they're necessary instead, um, especially in, you know, in fiction, especially in short fiction. You don't have room to, for a lot of distraction, distracting footnotes, I think, in a text like that. In tra on translatability, though, um, maybe because I make my living translating, I, I refuse to believe in untranslatability. Um, I think that if a person can think a thought, and if a person is a good writer, they can probably explain that thought in, in writing. And if you can do it in one language, you can do it in another language as well. I think so, anyway. Um, it's different, of course, you know, there are words for things that don't exist in one 
linguistic contexts that do exist in others. So the Kazakh word kumis that you mentioned, Alta, is a, a drink made of fermented mare's milk, slightly alcoholic, found um, all over Central Asia and Mongolia. Um, so that's a, not a thing we can't explain. It's just a thing we don't drink in English. Um, if you can drink things in a language and put it that way. Um, so I don't think things like that are untranslatable, but um, then it's a question of style. If you want to leave words alone, explain them, not explain them, expect the reader to figure them out or look them up and kind of do some work to, to expand their vocabularies. That's excellent. You're reminding me of the first time I went to a conference of the American Literary Translators Association. And I think it was over breakfast, but I was seated with two translators working from Russian and we immediately started talking about food and names for food and how, you know, every pasta is described, you know, when they're commercially distributed. Um, food, any of these very sensual uh, nourishing things oftentimes. Oops, sorry. I I'm not sure when I muted myself. I think I was realizing we have an excellent, excellent question that just came in from a fellow translator, Jeremy Tang. What do we think about non-translation as a strategy of resistance? Everything may be translatable, but should everything be translated? Maybe I'll, I'll take that question since I was already sort of on a roll about this. Um, Hi, Jeremy, I, I think I agree with the premise that I'm seeing there, which is, yeah, maybe everything should not be translated. There's some, should be some things that can be left as they are. And that's where I think expecting the reader to do some work comes in. Um, and we translators can push some of that responsibility for understanding our texts onto the reader um, and assume they're curious enough to, um, well, to do that work, to investigate and to learn something um, and respect what they're learning. So I hope that answers question a little bit. Christine, do you have any thoughts about should things? Uh, Hi, Jeremy. <laughs> I'm in the same group as Jeremy and haven't I haven't been attending meetings, so sorry. <laughs> um, now translation is resistance, uh, definitely. And I also agree with Shelley. So um, I don't think I have anything to add. Um, I think Shelley fully captured it. Yeah, and I'll just add, you know, uh, Jeremy and I both attended this symposium last Friday for International Day of Translation that was organized by the Center for the Art of Translation. And I remember one of the panelists, let's see, it was about um, advocating for translation. I'm going to completely butcher this. I, recordings, I believe, will go online through the Center for the Art of Translation. But this panel was addressing uh, my, the best way I can express it right here, right now, is that the difference between advocating for translators, the people who practice translation, and the difference between advocating for translation itself. Um, and the, the discussion addressed a lot more, but one of, one of the panelists had actually said, you know, there was this moment when uh, a few, uh, again, I'm gonna butcher, this is, this is why I'm not naming the very eminent translator uh, critic who, who said this, um, but basically there, were, there are these moments, and I, I believe the example this person cited was, you know, a couple of writers in South America were very hot in the US market. So uh, that led to a whole flood of more translations. And I was quite shocked, um, I guess not surprised, but shocked to have this, to hear this panelist say, it led to a, many more translations, but also of a lot of stuff that frankly, maybe shouldn't have been translated. And I don't think he was saying it in a resistance kind of way. I think he was saying it in a, these stories were not up to par. That was how I read that. Anyway, uh, it's complicated. Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, Shelly, thank you for your much more concise answer to that. Um, I believe 
my my other my my final question for you all um and of course i'll have more as soon as this zoom call ends but i wanted to talk about um you know we've talked about translation and as as a mode um and how it might aid or abet <laughs> decolonization um what about diasporic i don't i don't think that word has come up yet but i feel like i have to mention it because both of you know both of you have have worked on these collections that contain a multitude of source languages or i mean in shelley's case it's two in amanat kazakh and 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 russian but all of these um I'm I'm fairly certain, even if it's a small population, all of these languages have speakers in the United States for various reasons. Um, and maybe Christine, I think, um, you know, coming from the Philippines with so many languages, the hierarchy between these languages, or you know, you find differences of um, the populations. So I guess any thoughts about the diaspora? Um, I know that, you know, oftentimes languages shift, um, they, they get preserved. And I did want to return to this notion, um, that I mentioned in the beginning, like can translation preserve, um, without, without necessarily stultifying or, um, lang we all know language is a living thing. So any thoughts about diasporic, um, your work as translators, your potential readership, um i hope that question made sense mm. uh the philippine diaspora has been very helpful in publicizing ulirat um because for a very long time they, they these uh, writers in the diaspora they write originally in english so they become the uh, the default representation of the Philippines, but they're just a small uh, fraction of the voices that exist in the Philippines. Just the ones that, uh, because of the 150 languages and the only uh, works that are being seen by the internationally that has the name Philippines on it that can be uh, connected to the Philippines are the ones in the diaspora. So uh, in Ulirat, there's only one writer in the diaspora. We included Sosimo Kibilan. Uh, he wrote a flash fiction and of course, Mom Gina who helped us with her foreword. So I think uh, translation, literary translation in our case in the Philippines, it's a, a good way to, to even out the cultural influence uh, make sure uh, maybe how to dismantle that hierarchy, the diaspora in terms of visibility, because it's more visible in the en English speaking world. So we can address that hierarchy with uh, having more translations. So the right translations, not just translation for the sake of it, because this is the one from this language is the only one we can find. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, I think, uh, yeah, yeah the, um, the more good translations, the better. I think we can all agree. Um, the Kazakhstani diaspora community in the United States is pretty small, um, but I do have a story about um, the Fili Filipino community in the United States and Ulrat, actually. So um, my promise, Christine, I would, I would tell this story. Um, my father-in-law is Filipino. He moved uh, to the United States for graduate school and stayed, got married, raised a family, has been here ever since. Um, but his field is the sciences and he doesn't read Filipino literature. And I think he maybe wasn't aware that there was any such thing as Filipino literature <laughs> until I gave him a copy of Ularat. And he was amazed. Um, he's never talked to me so long about a book before. We had the most amazing conversation. Like he didn't know um, the word in the title of the rat. He had never heard it before. He called home and told his uh, his cousins about it. And they're like, yeah, everybody knows that word. What's wrong with you? So he learned even the title word was new to him. He didn't know that there were Filipino like academics studying literature and writing about literature in the United States. 
So um, I like to think that your book, Christine, kind of like um, just blew his mind. <laughs> he really learned something about himself and his own kind of native culture that he hadn't known or fully appreciated before. So that's a really interesting side effect of translating literature into English and publishing it here. Um, I haven't heard a story like that about um, Kazakhstanis yet, but you know, maybe I will one day. That's, Thank you. That's so great. Yeah, Christine, did you have any additional thoughts or just? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was not expecting the connecting point between these two collections to be necessarily one of your relatives, <laughs> but. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great coincidence. Um, G, how are we doing on time? Are we okay? Um, yeah, we're doing very, uh, we're doing fine on time. Um, you know, we could, you know, wrap up here or, you know, um, maybe ask the audience whether they have any final questions for our panel. I have one more, but I do want to encourage, I feel as though the audience is, um, we've had, some great questions so far. I just want don't want to run over too far over the the allotted time, and I realize everyone's time and attention are very precious. Um, so I'll, I'll I guess I'll wrap up my questions with this, and any audience questions that come in as I'm asking this, we will also include. Um, you know, I thought a lot about not only because of the Glissant quote, but also, you know, these thinking of these two collections um, and you know, there, there are links in the chat, please. I really encourage everyone to, to check these out. Um, you know, one, when I first thought about how am I going to hold a discussion with these two amazing translators, because, you know, the, the collections are really each deserve a lot more time. Um, but I really appreciate the generosity with which both of you have shared your approaches today. Um, you know, so to go back to this utopian, I really view Gaudy Boy and G, you know, I, this is a question for, for Shelly and Christine, but I'm going to loop you in as well, G, as publisher of Gaudy Boy, because it seems to me like a utopian project. And I always think about the word utopia, really the Greek, you know, the etymologically, it means a not place, like, which could be interpreted as, as a place that doesn't exist. Um, but tying back to this notion of archipelagic dreaming, archipelago dreaming, I do think that uh, you know it's it's been said before we cannot achieve something until we can dream about it, until we can envision it, until we can put language to it. And I think that's one of the exciting things about seeing how languages are changing. So I want to thank both um, Shelley and Christine for creating a scintillatingly specific place for these stories in each of your collections and hopefully in readers' souls as well. Can you share with us your vision for what's next? What needs to change in Anglophone publishing or what hope are you finding in the translation community you're working in and what are you currently working on? So uh, Christine, I know you mentioned you are in a collective if you would like to tell us about that. Um, yeah, what's next? What Mm, the seems it's a, a small group of Southeast Asian translators and uh, what's important about it, I think uh, from the get go, we agreed on, we're not going to say this is the best group of the best translators in Southeast Asia. So we want to um, encourage everyone to form collectives of their own and uh, to share resources so, and support each other. Uh, and I've been thinking um, recently about, about translators uh, being replaced by AI. So it's been, <laughs> it's keeping me up at night. Uh, but I think it's a, a, a very, very uh, human activity that uh, can't be replaced. I don't, I don't think you can do it with a machine. If you Google translate something, it just, it just doesn't have the soul 
to it if you uh, compared to when a person actually translates a certain text like a, a fiction or a, or a poem so yeah uh, what's next for translation i think we're living in a in a bombastic world where everyone it's like we're more open now we're open to new ideas new concepts acceptance is uh acceptance of other cultures and uh is also it's also becoming more rampant everywhere so i think the future is it's more inclusive and translation is one of the ways we can get to that kind of future uh you told Thank you, Christine. Shelley? My, um, my personal corner of the translation world um, in Central Asia has always felt a little neglected. So I'm really happy um, that, you know, G and Gaudi Boy are willing to, you know, look at Amanat, Kazakhstani literature as Asian literature. It's nice to belong somewhere on the map of the world. Um, for a long time, Central Asia was mostly thought of as kind of a weird exotic backwater of Russian literature. Um, and it's sort of, uh, you know, it's influenced by Russian literature, but not only by Russian literature. There are a lot of Persian influences, um, European influences, Asian influences to it. And so it's great to be, um, to have this kind of recognition coming around of, of where Central Asia is as a crossroads of civilizations, cultures, and interesting writing, um, especially in these days when this relationship with Russia can only hurt authors in Central Asia, um, the worst that Russia behaves on the world scene, um, with its serious misbehavior in Ukraine, um, has really shaken up everybody who translates from Russian, um, as well as everybody who creates things in the Russian language. Um, so all of us are sort of worried about the future. Will anyone want to read a Russian book ever again? Um, will there ever be Russian government funding and will we want to use it if it's available again? Um, that kind of question. Um, so I, I'm lucky that I've been working on Central Asia for a long time. So I'm sort of off, off to the side of those um, terrifying questions that my Russian translation colleagues are, are, are grappling with. Um, so Central Asia seems like a safe place suddenly instead of a, instead of a strange neglected neighborhood in world literature. So I think I'll probably stay here for a while. Um, I've got two in my immediate future. I've got two books more coming out from Central Asia. One is um, actually by two of the authors showcased in Amanat, Lilia Kalaus and Zira Narizbay. Um, they've collaborated for a while on a, a children's adventure series um, starring a little boy named Batu, who's a Kazakh boy and his uh, Kazakh and Russian friends in Kazakhstan. And they go on adventures based on like the magical world of Kazakh mythology. So the first book in that series is coming out for Amazon Crossing Kids in March, and I'm really excited about that. Um, and then the last book I finished translating is by Hamid Ismailov, who blurbed um, Amanat, um, which Alta mentioned. And Hamid um, happens to have written a, a great epic Russian novel in the tradition of war and peace and so on, except it's uh, centered in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, rather than in Moscow or St. Petersburg. So it brings with it a whole different sensibility and um, set of references and influences while addressing some of the same big philosophical themes that um, the Russian greats address in their big work. So I'm hoping to find a publisher for that one um, and share yet another view of, you know, of this um, Russian speaking, but not necessarily Russian world um, with the English reading public. So that's my, my, my current attempts to um, contribute to the, the utopian literary future here through translation. That's so, so exciting. Thank you, Shelley. I can't wait to read. Um, let's see, we have, there's, it's not a question, it's a comment. And then G, I do want to hear what's next for you and for Gaudy Boy. I just want to share what Joe Peter has shared. If literature moves from text to sound, then you will find how ethnomusicologists like Jose Maceda in the Philippines have suggested ways to move forward. With the technology that you are using now, there is great hope great discussion. I hope he means the technology we're using now being um, publishing these books, because that is the great technology. It's very durable as well, portable and durable. Um, 
which speaking of technology, Christine, you know, you reminded me, I occasionally, because I regularly get involved in conversations, someone says, oh, you're a translator, you know, get ready because Google's going to replace you. Um, you know, I, I don't have anything else. I won't share with you my answers to those people at cocktail parties and things, but I do occasionally go on to Google Translate and I enter one of you know, something that I'm working on where I found an un, what I would consider an untranslatable. And I see what Google Translate tries to do with it. And um, I don't know if the two of you have tried that. It can be, um, it can be very entertaining. It can be very um, disappointing. You know, I think one of, um, I forgot who it was and one of the introductions talked about, you know, mistranslations and um, yeah. Anyway, technology, living language, technology, if a human wrote it or a human spoke it, a human needs to be involved in the sensitive process of bringing it to other human ears. So I will get off my soapbox now. And gee, what is next for you, for Singapore Unbound and for Gaudi Boy? Oh, thanks, uh, uh, Alta. Uh, I read Joe Peters' uh, comment a little differently uh when he uh wrote you know with the technology you're using now i thought he meant uh, he was referring to the zoom technology <laughs> and because of course you know she was referring to uh ethno uh musicologists isn't it so yeah i can imagine of course you know with zoom we will be able to perhaps you know bring something that is oral originally you know in some more intact oral form right uh, using zoom technology which tells me really that, you know, print is so powerful for all of us. I'm assuming that we all love books here. And it's of course a form of technology as well, but it has its limitations. So really part of my thinking as a publisher is to try not to imagine I'm going to solve all the problems of the world. <laughs> because I, we're only doing just dealing with one technology in one little, you know, corner of the field. But to try to do that uh, in a way that breaks down barriers, that breaks down hierarchies, that resists domination all right, by the bigger major voices. So doing what we can uh, with what we have, I think is very much you know, uh, part of uh, what Body Boy, uh, the press does. I just want to say you know, in terms of utopia that <laughs> Um, not to sound too cheesy, it has been kind of utopian working with our two editors, translators, uh, Shelley and Christine. I mean, because we, when we work with them, they changed us. <laughs> I mean, you know, they have been so gracious in thanking Gaudi Boy, you know, for putting this out. And, and definitely my team put in a great deal of talent, time and thought. But they, by coming to us, have actually changed Gaudi Boy. So when we first started Gaudi Boy in you know, 2018, we were going to just publish you know, writings in English by Asians from around the world, wherever they may be. And we thought it was very ambitious. And then Christine approached us with Uli Rat. <laughs> I know this fantastic groundbreaking anthology in seven different languages from the Philippines, I thought, we have to launch a translation imprint just to publish this. We have to do this. I mean, there's no way. I mean, this is such a precious, precious collective effort, right? Collaboration between the authors and the translators and collectors. So, yeah, so we launched the imprints because of you, <laughs> Christine, right? And then after that, when Shelley, you know, approached us you know, soon after that, to publish Amanat. Again, it was, I must confess, Kazakhstan was a country I knew very, very little about. So it was a process of really educating ourselves, you know, working with, you know, Shelley and her co-editor, Zaura, you know, as to what is sensitive, culturally sensitive, uh, and what, you know, should be preserved, right, as it is. So we're learning, I think, and that I think is part of what I mean by utopian, our utopian really relationship, there is this process of learning and a process of collaboration. It is not a benefactor, benefact, <laughs> whatever you call it, right? you know, somebody who benefits. It's not that kind of a relationship. It was very much a kind of partnership. And still, we are constantly learning. So for example, Christine and her fellow uh, co-editors are going to bring out a collection of poetry 
from the Philippines in how many languages again, Christine? 21. I think we'll go for 20. I think it's so 20. 20 this time. And so it's so exciting. And I remember, you know, talking to Christine about a selection of these uh, poets and coming from, you know, the American perspective, we're saying, oh, let's pay attention to, you know, identity markers, right? Like we want to make sure we have, you know, as many women, if not more than men, poets representing. And Christine very wisely came back to us and says, you know what? The big problem here in the Philippines is class. <laughs> it's, I mean, gender is a problem too, I assume, but it's class. <laughs> so we want to represent many working class or poets that are marginalized because of their class or because of their politics. And it's like, yeah, that's absolutely right. So, you know, of course we agree to the, uh, to the selection that they're gonna make and then help, again, help us to see things uh, differently from where they come from. Uh, and I think that is such a precious relationship. Thank you so much, you know, Christine, and thank you so much, uh, Shelley, for working with us, you know, through our uh, very ignorant, very stumbling uh, uh, initial position. Hopefully we are a little bit more informed now, uh, but certainly we are very, very open to working with you again. We are, in fact, working with you again and with other translators and editors uh, because we really want to support the work of uh, dismantling hierarchy, dismantling colonialism, and giving the voices that have been marginalized by power a chance to speak. And that seems like the perfect point to just remind everyone here that the this is, let's see, you're launching the in-person events for Singapore Inbound tonight, G, correct? Um, that there's an entire feast of a festival in store. Uh, yes. Yes, uh, definitely. I am so wonderful to be able to meet uh, in this virtual way because, of course, you know, it brings together technology again, right? Brings together all of us from all over the place. Uh, but we also love meeting in person. And tonight is going to be the uh, opening address um, of the festival. And it will be given by the extraordinary Filipina novelist uh, Gina Apostol. Uh, her name has already come up, and Gina is going to speak on the topic, Insular Fantasies, Capitalist Nightmare, Revolutionary Dreams. Now, if that title doesn't get you down to the People's Forum in Manhattan, I don't know what will. I have actually had a privilege. It, it is the fiercest thing out there. <laughs> Very honest very passionate uh, and it is the kind of uh, talk, I guess, you know, that we're so proud to be able to present uh, to you. So please come and join us uh, tonight if you are in New York and the festival goes on for the next two days on Friday and Saturday. Uh, there are events both in the afternoon as well as well in the evening. So check out the festival website for all the details. And I think, you know, it is now I'm going to put on, uh, well, I'm going to continue, I'll tell you if I may. Absolutely. By thanking you <laughs> <laughs> for, you know, doing such a great job of actually moderating this conversation. Uh, those questions that you came up with were so pertinent and really gave, you know, all of us a chance to think about the role of translation in our world right now. And of course, thank you so much, Christine. Uh, for joining us from the Philippines and Shelley from joining us uh, for joining us from Seattle, you know where you are, uh, to actually talk a little bit of more about your work. Uh, I think what you just said about translation again is helping me to learn more <laughs> about the whole process uh, that you are engaged in. So, if I may ask everybody to give uh, our, all our panelists and our moderator a round of applause again. I hope you see all the hands going up. <laughs> and right. our and ASL interpreters. <laughs> yes, that was what exactly what I was going to come with next. Thank you, Alta. Our appreciation and our gratitude to our ASL interpreters, you know, La uh, Lavender, Lavender, sorry, and uh, Kayla. Um, it was really wonderful to be able to uh, 
hear, so to speak, all right, the uh, conversation in your way as well. Yeah, thank you for helping us through that. All right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for attending, you know, this uh, event. Uh, we hope you have found, you know, something entertaining, something useful, something thought-provoking to bring away with you. And we're going to say, yes, get hold of the books. <laughs> and and uh, we're going to just uh, bid everyone goodbye now. And we hope to see you at uh, the festival, the rest of the festival. Thank you everyone and bye for now.